Good morning, church. As we take our offering, I just wanted to uh, make a comment about um, Todd and Tamara's testimony video. What a powerful thing that was to watch. Um, yeah, amen. I'm, I'm so thankful not only for, for their story, but also um, just for the fact that, that we have a God that allows stories like that to happen. Um, we, we are just blown away at the power of God, and um, I'm also thankful for Daniel Stearns, who put that video together, who did a great job doing that. Um, yeah, amen. Um, as, we're, as we're taking our offering, I just want to talk a little bit about Hope Month, and welcome, 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 welcome to Hope Month. Uh, uh, yeah, who, who here served yesterday? Yeah, come on. Um, it was, I, I heard some pretty am- amazing stories of impact. Uh, we had uh, over 1,100 hours of service yesterday at, at eight different locations. And yesterday, there were more than 250 disciples who served. So what an amazing, amazing thing it is to know that we can have an impact on our community. Yesterday alone, God is moving in a supernatural way in this congregation. And it's exciting because we are living in the middle of it. I love this church family. Um, and also, I just before I dive into the sermon, I want to say a huge thank you to Alex and Nudia Rivas, who put on our Hope Month. They've done all the work connecting to the organizations. They've been absolutely outstanding managing the volunteers. You are not easy to manage. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, and they've also just done a great job of connecting with organizations that really do have an impact in Broward County. I also want to say thank you to our team leaders. Um, yesterday, John Brush led a team, uh, Anna Castillo, Corinne Eugene, Mary Tavias, Tony Fernandez Sr., and Derek Jean. They did an awesome job leading their teams. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to be a part of a church that's trying to live not for ourselves. Last two weeks, we've been talking about living out that motto of being a church not for ourselves. Last week, we spoke about social justice, um, and you can hear that lesson. I know it wasn't on the live stream, but you can hear it on BrowardChurch.org if you would like to hear it. Um, and this week, we're going to continue in that vein by talking about a life of service. Uh, let me say a quick prayer, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Father, we, we thank you for being such an amazing God. We thank you that we get to pray to you. Thank you that you are Alpha, Omega, beginning and end, and yet you also call us your children. What amazing honor it is to be the child of the great I Am. Man, thank you, God, for just being our Father. Thank you for also um, taking care of our needs. Thank you for being there for us, even when we aren't there for ourselves, God. We ask you today that, that you speak to us through your word. I ask you to speak through me as I um, use your scriptures to illustrate a point about service. Father, I love you. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think you would probably agree that we live in a me-first culture. Um, there is just kind of a me-first mentality, and it seems as though you are born with this me-first mentality. Cadence, my 13-month, 13-month-old daughter, she's adorable and all that stuff. Look at her. She's, she's so cute. Um, she's, she's already showing signs of this me first mentality. My wife and I are trying to teach her to kiss us goodnight before she goes to bed. Sort of like a little thing. We're trying to teach her to, to come out. I go, mmm, and she goes, mmm, and she's supposed to come and kiss me on the, on the lips. Uh, but what she's been doing is going, mmm, and then mmm, and then walking past me. <laughs> and so I've been trying to sort of teach her, and so this is what I got. Ready? This is a little video. Isn't that cute? Besito Papa. You see that? I say, Besito Papa, and then she kisses me. It's wonderful. It's a cute thing. But, but, she's, but, but see, her, her enthusiasm is not um, aimed at her loving father. <laughs> she is not kissing me because she loves me. That's not what's happening here. Uh, she's not because, you know, I love Papa so much that I'm going to go and I'm going to give him a kiss. What you can't see is that I'm holding something behind my back. <laughs> she wants food. <laughs> And so I convinced her that if, I, if she kisses me, she will get some food. <laughs> and so now she kisses me. It's my food that she wants. She doesn't really want me because she's a me-first baby. She's not kissing me because she loves me. She's not showing me, oh, her amazing adoration towards her father, even though I provide for her and give her everything that she needs in her life. It's not because she, she loves me that she's kissing me. It's because she wants something from me. We're sort of born with this thing. I'm just going to let that keep looping because it's cute. (laughs) There was a survey done of 1,000 children ages 6 to 17. I guess they're not children. 
And they were asked, when I grow up, I want to be, and here's what they said, this is the top 10 career kids would like to be when they grow up. Number one, a YouTuber. Number two, a blogger or vlogger. Number three, a musician or singer. Number four, an actor. Number five, a filmmaker. Not until you get to number six do you get sort of a decent career. Uh, <laughs> number six, a doctor or nurse. Number seven, a TV presenter. Number eight, an athlete. Number nine, a writer, uh, teacher. And number 10, a writer. Gone are the days when kids want to be firefighters and police officers and lawyers. When the kids who chose these specific career paths were asked why they wanted to do this, basically everything here except for doctor and teacher, when they were asked why, why do you want to be a YouTube star? Why do you want to be a TV personality? Why do you want to be an actor? Why do you want to be a filmmaker? The number one response was this, I want to be famous. And some of us who are a little bit older, today I turned 30, so I feel like I'm in that club. Uh, uh, but they, there's like, some of us are feeling like, oh, that's society. This, oh, uh, they're ruining people. But look, it, it's been the same forever. People want to be famous. They want to be known. They want to be great. They want to be admired. They want people to look at them and go, oh, no, 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 you're doing something really, really good. We live in a me-first world. We are taught from a young age that greatness comes with self-promotion. That greatness is built on how much you make or how much influence you have or how much popularity you've been able to gain over your life. It's about how much money you're able to make. Greatness is about your ability to pull other toward yourself and to get ahead. It's all about winning in the rat race. That's what makes you great. Our instincts are me first. The instructions that we're given by marketing agencies and, and, uh, and all throughout our media and our news is me first. We are taught it's me first at school. It's me first at work. It's me first at home. Me, 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 me. You don't have to teach a child to say me or to say mine. You do have to teach them to say thank you. You don't have to teach a child to say, give me. You do have to teach them to say, share. And here's the question we're going to try to answer. How can we have a God-first mentality in a me-first world? How can we have a God-first mentality in a me-first world? Is it even possible? Is it even possible to be people not for ourselves? Is it even possible to be a person not for ourselves? See, as our world teaches us, me first, me first, me first, Jesus teaches something uh, dramatically different. Matthew chapter 19, verse 30, this is what Jesus says. He says, many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. In other words, it's not those who get ahead who are ahead. In God's economy, Many who are first will be last. Many who have allowed themselves to fight to be first will actually be last. And those who have yielded themselves to others will, in fact, be first. And see, if you haven't found it out yet, you, you will at some point in your life. If you live where everything in life is about you. If you live with the mentality that it's about me making money, it's about me getting fame, it's about me getting resources, it's about me growing and me becoming better, and it's all about me, 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 me. If you live in that, all your money is about you, all your time is spent on you, all your, uh, all your activities are built around you being better or you being more important. If you live that way, what you're going to realize is that me first is actually miserable. Me first is miserable. It's miserable to never have a thought apart from yourself. It's miserable to fight to get to the top and realize that you haven't gotten anywhere. It's miserable to never let anyone in your life because you're always protecting your image. It's miserable for your life to be all about you. It's miserable. And on top of that, it doesn't really even work. You can't be a me first Christian Especially, it doesn't work, especially when you're a disciple, when you're trying to follow God. It really is impossible to be a me first Christian because te Jesus' teachings are diametrically opposed to this self centered, selfish, self promoting culture. Today, our, st our study will continue sort of from last week in the vein of Jesus' life and trying to figure out how do we become people that are not for ourselves. And we're going to study out Jesus' last week on earth his last week of life as he addresses the disciples who are in pursuit of self and shows them a way out. If you would, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 10? Amen. 
In Mark 10, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's followed by 12 apostles and the multitudes that are always following him. They have been following since the beginning of his ministry. Crowds of tens of thousands at times um, would follow him because he fed them, he healed them, he taught them, he preached to them. And so they were always there because they got a lot out of Jesus. And, and so uh, Jesus was kind of a rock star in every city that he went to. And so his disciples began, began to get very famous. All of his disciples were also rock stars because Jesus was a rock star. If you couldn't get to Jesus, you could get to his disciples. This is, the the part we're going to read is is just about a week again before Jesus' death. And Jesus, knowing that these same admirers are going to be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him in about a week, he decides to pull all his disciples together, his closest followers, and say, look, those people over there, they're not exactly what they crack up to be. And in addition to that, what's going to happen to me when I enter Jerusalem is not really what you think is going to happen. See, they thought he would go in and he would be crowned king, that he would rule over them, that he would have this just incredible power, that he would go in and and take the the mantle of, of the leader of the people of Jerusalem. But that's not exactly what happened. Instead, he rides in and Jesus explains what's going to happen to him in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. This is what it says. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who later who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Jesus is telling his disciples, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be spat upon. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be tried. And eventually, I'm going to be put to death. This should be a somber, a somber moment for the disciples, but instead, here's what happens next. Verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. This is a strange transition. <laughs> I'm going to die, Jesus says. The disciples say, yeah, 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 cool. Jesus, I want you to do something for me. And here's the request. What do you want me to do from you? He asked, Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and let the other one sit at your left hand in your glory. They say, look, 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 Jesus, I I know you just talked about the fact that you're going to be killed and and, and ridiculed and persecuted and all that stuff. Yeah, and that's, I'm sure that's going to be really difficult. But, But let me just ask you a question. Can I be great? I want to be great. I want to be awesome. Teacher, Lord, I want to be great. Can you make me great? Can you put me at your right hand? I want to be your right hand man. The other one's like, I want to be your left hand man. Can we rule with you? Can we have the same authority you have? Can we have your power? And this is, this is absolutely insane. This is one of the most insensitive things in the whole of the New Testament. And worse, in the account in Matthew chapter 20, it says they brought their mom Man, how low can you go? <laughs> and Jesus replies, woman? Oh, I love that. Anyway, can, can, can you just imagine this? Jesus is talking about his death, and they want, him, they want him to do them a favor. The other apostles then see James and John going up to Jesus, asking for power. They're seeing him in this little private conversation, and so they get indignant. And they break out into this argument. We're going to skip down to verse 41. This is, this is what it says. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. They also want to fight for glory. Right after Jesus finished telling them, okay, I'm going to die, they're like, James and John's like, I want to be great. And the disciples are like, no, 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 I want to be great. All of them have disregarded the message of the cross. You know, it's interesting to me because what I see is that the message of the gospel is missed by me first mentality. The message of the gospel is, The idea that Jesus would live, die, and resurrect for us. The fact that Jesus would suffer for us. When we are focused on me, 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 what happens is we just miss that whole idea. All these disciples just miss the message of the cross. And so the story continues. Jesus notices notices that that they're fighting. And so verse 42, this is what it says. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. 
And their high officials exercise authority over them. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentile and the high officials, that they, they use their authority. They, they lord it over you. They take advantage. See, ancient rulers were self-promoting. They were arrogant. And maybe modern rulers are the same way. They're, self, they're self-exalting. They are, they're, they're sort of like dictators, domineering. They lord over people. They were brutal. They were harsh. They were abusive. And the disciples were used to this type of leadership. They were used to it with with Caesar and with Pilate. They were used to it with the Herodians and Herod the Great. They They were used to it with all the religious leaders. Jesus said they would devour widows, the religious leaders. They were abusive. They were neglecting. They were always jockeying for position, for power. Jesus says, you've noticed those people. Have you seen them? And then he goes on and says this. So says, he called them together. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And he says this, verse, there's verse uh, 43. It says, not so with you. Not so with you. When you have an opportunity to have position, when you have entitlements, when you have authority, I don't want you to do what they do. I don't want you to act the way they act. I don't want you to respond the way they respond. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. If you want to be first, you become a slave. In other words, if you want to be great, don't self-promote. If you want to be great, don't come and ask me to be great. Instead, look at your brothers. Look at the multitudes. Go serve them. True greatness is found in servanthood. This conversation happens on the road headed to Jerusalem, and when they arrive in Jerusalem, the fight continues about who's going to be great. It happens, this fight continues all the way until Luke chapter 22 tells us that the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest all the way until the Last Supper. For that week, they're fighting, I'm better, I'm better. Peter's like, I walked on water. John's like, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. Bartholomew's like, nobody knows who Bartholomew is. <laughs> no, but he's like, I'm pretty cool. To, like, they're all sort of jockeying for position the whole week. And Jesus is just sort of thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, you might imagine. And, and this conversation happens all the way until 24 hours before Jesus is arrested. And here's what happens 24 hours before Jesus is arrested. This is John chapter 13, verse 1. It says this. It was before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. We're going to skip to verse 3. It says this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus looks around this room at these men who have been fighting about who is the greatest, fighting about how amazing they are. He looks at these prideful men, these people with proud hearts, and the Bible says that Jesus sat there and knew that all authority had been given to him. Jesus understood his power. Jesus understood his prominence. He knew that he was entitled to actually be king. He knew that he was the son of God. He knew that he was the bread of life, that he was the prince of peace, that he was king of glory, that he was king of all kings, lord of all lords. Jesus knew in his life that he was alpha, omega, beginning, and end. Jesus knew that he was powerful that he had all power and all authority, that anything he wanted to do, he could do. Jesus looks around the room and notices his incredible power. And he saw these prideful men who were entitled. And so what does he do? Let me tell you what he did. Well, first, let me tell you what he didn't do. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to go down the street because there are some men who are trying to kill me, and I'm going to go and rip them to shreds. He doesn't do that. No, 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 no. What happens next next is absolutely incredible. Verse 4, he got up from the meal, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel wrapped around him. Do you know what your Savior did when he was most aware of his power and his authority? The Bible says that he became a servant. When he was most aware, when he was most aware of his greatness, when he was most aware 
that he was the greatest living person ever, when he had all the power and all the authority and all the rule that he could ever have, when he became aware of it, he says, you know what, I'm not going to use that to domineer. I'm not going to use that to dominate this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take off my authority. I'm going to get on my knee and I'm going to wash my disciples' feet. Proud hearts, dirty feet. The hands that touched those men's dirty feet were the hands of a living God. The hands that did the work of a slave were the hands of a living God. They were the hands that gave sight to the blind. They were the hands that, became, that raised the dead. They were the hands that helped create the universe. Those were the hands that washed their dirty, disgusting feet. Jesus had all the right to say, that's not my job. I'm entitled to a lot more. I'm going to die tomorrow. I need some rest. Jesus had all the authority to say, you know what, I'm too great for this terrible task. But he doesn't. Instead, he gets on his knees, stoops down, and instead makes his disciples great. When he had finished washing their feet, this is verse 12, he put on his clothes. He put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. To which, of course, no one said anything. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, and rightly so. Oh, he says, I'm sorry, my thing skipped. Okay. He says, you call me Lord, you call me teacher, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Verse 14. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly. I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. He says, I have set an example for you, and you will be blessed if you do it. See, brothers and sisters, at any moment, at any place, at any point, when it draws on you that you are entitled to not serve, you're on shaky ground. If there's any moment in your life where you go, you know what, I've put in enough time. You know, I have done enough. I am too special to serve. I am too great to serve. You know, I don't even have enough time to serve. I'm, not that imp- I'm too important for that little task. I can't, you know, wipe babies' butts and kingdom kids. I'm a lawyer. If it ever dawns on you that you are entitled, just remember what Jesus said, I have set an example for you to follow. When you realize that you have authority in life, when you realize that, okay, maybe you do have prominence in life, that is the perfect time to serve. These are our marching orders. You don't have to to be a Bible scholar to understand this passage. This is not like, well, I'm breaking free some truth that you never understood before. This is just a very simple idea. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Be a servant. You want to break free from yourself? serve other people. You want life to the full? Give of yourself. You want a a great life. You want a great life. Stop looking for opportunities to self-promote and self-protect. Instead, look for opportunities to serve. Greatness in God's kingdom is calculated by service in God's kingdom. If you want to be first, then be a servant. If you want to be really great, then be a slave. The great among us are never the people who decide that they are better than the rest of us. The great among us are the people who are willing to get on our knees, put a towel on our waist, and wash some feet. As imitators of Jesus, as disciples of Christ, serving shouldn't just be what we do, it's who we are. Serving isn't what we do. It's not like I'm serving. I'm, I'm serving. No, no, no. I am a servant. If I'm a disciple, I'm a servant. And I want to acknowledge some of the people in our congregation who are great servants. I asked the staff to send me some suggestions. And they sent me so many names that I can't even go through all of them. All I know is that you're, the staff of this church and the elders of this church absolutely love you guys. <laughs> you are outstanding. We have literally so many. I just want to point out two people or two groups of people that I think are just doing an outstanding job, and I just want to acknowledge them. First is Chuck Steele and the parking crew. <laughs> Outside, it's 90 degrees at least. And it's humid as all get out. A friend of mine said, living in South Florida is like living in a mouth. 
It's hot and it's wet. <laughs> and Chuck Steele is out there every single Sunday. He's out there on Wednesdays. He's out there for every special event. He recruits the crew, he, he trains the crew, and he does an amazing job. Somebody told me that Chuck Steele has been doing this for 20 years. For 20 years. I have, I have never heard him complain. I have never heard him say, you know, it's too hot today to do this. I've never heard him come inside and go, you know what? Like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. He's a servant because it's, serving isn't just something he does. It's who he is. I also want to acknowledge William Galicia. Yeah. William, <laughs> William lives in Tamarack. He lives up north, and there has never been a time where I've called William and said, hey, William, I need some help changing lights or changing a projector or fixing the sound or that he won't come after work after working eight hours, come here and serve for another four hours. He will miss times hanging out with his wife in order to help with what's being done here. And, and I can say, hey, William, can you just take care of that? And by Sunday morning, I will come in and I'll know that it is done. William is an amazing servant. It's, serving isn't just what he does, it's who he is. <laughs> Most often, when I feel like I don't need to do something, when I feel like it's beneath me to serve in that way, when I feel like I'm too important to do it, I feel like God is actually prodding me to do the things. It's my pride that perks up during those times that I have to deny it because I have to remember that serving isn't just what I do, it's who I am. One day I was driving to the church um, on the way to a meeting and I was actually late for the meeting and I saw somebody pulled over on the side of the road and they were in that little area of the church um, where like you can still sort of get around them and so they pulled over there and they were in, a, in an old kind of beat up minivan and I was in a rush and I pulled over um, to, to their car mainly because um, I was pulling into the church and I had a church decal in the back of my car and I thought this is going to be a terrible example if I don't turn over but I thought someone else should be doing this anyway I turn over my car and I, I'm like hey do you need any help and it's a it's a lady with two children in the back and they're in an, again an older minivan and their car is you know smoking and um, and I'm like man this is going to be a terrible example if I just go okay goodbye and I just pull in and they're like we're, we're waiting for a triple eight uh, truck to come or car to come but it's been it's been here for a long time and it's like 90 degrees outside and so I decided to get out of my car I, I walk over to the car um, and I ask them to, to pop open the hood I don't know why people do this I don't know anything about the cars <laughs> but I asked them to pop open the hood and, and she's she asked me are you a car guy and I was like um, no but I'm gonna try to be <laughs> um, um, and so I open the hood I, I like look at it and I'm like, all right, <laughs> your car is smoking. Uh, you know, I close the hood. Um, and I, I, they're all the way at the entrance, all the way by the Broward Church sign. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Um, I'm like, all right, I'm going to push the car in. So I, I go behind the car, and I'm like, could you just steer and the, and as I push the car in? And she's like, you don't have to do that. I'm like, yeah, but you have kids, and it's hot, and, and you've been waiting a long time. And and so she's like, you don't have to do it. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do it. So, you know, I was like, you know, I'm in, I'm in nice church clothes, and I'm pushing this car. I'm pushing this car, and it's, it's by myself all the way down the, down the church parking lot. And I'm like, why do we have so many hills on this church parking lot? <laughs> um, and I'm like sweating. And, but, but what I loved is that the kids are in the back seat, and they're cheering me on. And they're, and they're, saying, and they're saying, car guy, car guy, car guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I'm not, I'm not, and I just, you know, I pulled them down here, they, I brought them inside, I gave them some water, whatever, let them sit in the air condition, but, but I'm not, I'm not sharing that example because I'm like special, I don't think I'm, I'm very special at all, as a matter of fact, I didn't want to serve, but I just thought it was really cool that they needed a car guy, and I wasn't a car guy, but, but I was a car guy for that moment, I, I was a car guy for that moment, I don't, maybe you're not a, a kid person, but could you be a kid person on Sunday morning? Maybe you're not a parking person, but could you be a parking person on Sunday morning to give Chuck Steele some help? Maybe you're not an elderly, helping the elderly person, but could you help the elderly when we go once a month? Maybe you're not a kid person, but could you help in four kids in some way? Can you meet a need? 
can you meet a need? There are so many needs that I know you can meet. But can you meet a need? You don't have to be a blank person to be the person. But can you meet a need? Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you for some help. We need some help in the church. I love our church. And I'm asking us together to step up here. Beginning August 19th, we are going to two services. We are growing in our attendance, and this Sunday we're a little bit lower, but I, I, I bet you we're still at 5 something, 5.30, 5.40, something like that. We're growing in our attendance every, every single week, and it's amazing. If you come in and you're a family of five right now and you're looking for a place to sit, where would you sit? Look around you. Do you see five seats anywhere near you? If you're a family of four, would you sit anywhere? You're, so we're trying to add a service so that we can continue to grow as a church. And so we need some help. We need some help. We're going to try something big. We're going to try something risky in order to help maybe save some more people. We're going to go from one 10 o'clock service to two services. One will be at 9.30 a.m. and the next one will be at 11.30 a.m. Sorry, 9 a.m. and the other one will be at 11.30 a.m. And we're doing that again in order to help more and more people become Christians. But if we're going to do that, we need more help. We need more help in our kingdom kids. We need about 60 more people in a kingdom kids rotation. 60 more people. That means the, the people who are serving plus 60 more if this is going to be sustainable. We need about 20 more people to help with hospitality, people doing greeting and people in the parking. We need, basically that's the majority of what we need. We need about 80 more volunteers. Each of you were given a card when you came in or they were on your seats. It's a little card that says what service are you going to and how can you serve? If you are already serving, meaning you're already doing Kingdom Kids, you're, you're serving in a way that's like, you know, William or one of those guys who does 70 things, I do not want you to fill out that card. But if you're not doing something right now, or maybe if you've been off of it, or maybe you thought, you know what, other people can do it, I'm asking, we need some more help. We need some help. Jesus set an example for us to follow, that we should be servants. We should be servants. It's time for us to step up. None of us are too good to wipe babies' butts. None of us are too good to help out in the parking lot. We need your help. So will you meet, meet a need? Will you fill out the cards and then drop them off to the back, to the ushers in the back, or to Chanel Woodson? Let's not just be consumers. Let's be contributors. If you want to be great in all aspects, we have to be people that serve not just here in the church, but also in the world. And I love what we're doing for Hope Month. If you're serving for Hope Month this upcoming week, um, man, it's going to be an amazing time together. And I want to close with this passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man, that would, be, that would be our Savior, that would be the one we sing to, that would be the one that's worthy of our worship. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Even the Son of Man, who was entitled to be honored and worshipped, did not come to be served, but to serve. For the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want to encourage you again to fill out a card, drop it off. We need your help. And let's see how we can be great in God's kingdom by serving together. Let's say a prayer and then we're going to end our service. Father, we thank you for the honor it is to serve. We know that it's not a burden to serve, but it's an honor. God, I pray that none of us would believe that we are too good to serve. Father, just as you, um, just as your son knelt down and washed his disciples' feet, something that he was way too good to do, but he decided to do it, God, I pray that we can have that same attitude, that we can, that we can um, use our influence and use our entitlement to, to help other people. God, we love you. We thank you. We, we, we honor you for the amazing ways that you've allowed us to become servants. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, have a great afternoon.